Hello. Welcome to the June 2022 edition of the Toronto Interpreters Practice. My name is Roni, and I'm part of the team that facilitates the interpreting practice. In this speech, I will try to give you an overview of the clinical trial process in plain language. But I'm aware how technical this subject matter is, so I might encourage you to take a look at the keywords and terms provided along with this speech before you attempt to interpret it. Now, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's dive right in. We all know that it's notoriously difficult to develop a new drug. In fact, a typical new drug takes about 13 years of research and development before it's allowed to hit the market. And the cost is also mind boggling. On average, a new drug costs about $2 billion to be developed. Now, before I break down this clinical trial process for you, I will preface this by saying that clinical trial can be characterized in four different phases, which focus on different aspects and involve different levels of complexity. If the result from one phase is satisfactory, the experiment will then move on to the next phase. And after all four phases are completed with results that meet the standards set by the regulatory body, a drug will be finally approved for use on the general population. So now let me dive into the four phases of the clinical trial process. Phase one is to determine whether a treatment is actually safe on the human body. And here I use the word treatment because uh, it could either be a drug or a vaccine or any other medical product subject to regulation. So at this point, you, uh, you hire a small number of volunteers, um, put the drug into their bodies and see if there's any um, harmful effects caused by the drug. If not, then congratulations, you can move on to phase two. And the focus of this phase is to determine if the drug or the product shows efficacy that is better than a placebo. You know, for, in other words, it, it does it work at all. Usually this stage um, involves about 10 to 100 patients, and it takes somewhere between several weeks and several months to wrap up. If a drug passes phase two, then it'll enter the most rigorous phase, which is phase three, where indeed most drugs do fail uh, this phase. So the standard, the bar is raised now. The standard is, does it work better than an existing treatment? Let's say you are developing a drug for a certain type of cancer, and there is this existing standard treatment for that cancer, you need to show that this new drug, it works better than the existing standard. And you can imagine how uh, this, this part of the experiment is actually very complicated. You need to recruit more volunteers that represent different um, health conditions, different demographic groups, uh, usually in the number of hundreds, sometimes thousands, and they need to be divided into different groups like the control group, the experimental group, uh, and, and these are uh, referred to as arms of the study design. Understandably, phase three also takes more time and more money, and still, this might sound disappointing, but most drugs that enter this phase still fail to get through that stage because from a regulatory standpoint, it's all understandable because phase three is actually often the, the final gatekeeper before a drug is approved for use. Now, that brings me to the question of why is there a fourth phase after that if after phase three, a drug is already approved? Well, phase four is called the post-marketing phase. This is conducted after a drug is already approved or approved on a preliminary basis for use with uh, the, actual, um, the actual patient population. But still, usually 
um, regulators will require some more data to be obtained to monitor the long-term benefits and side effects of that drug. Now, before I wrap up, I just want to add a note about the different stakeholders that are involved in this process. First of all, you have the pharmaceutical companies that are funding the studies. Usually these are the owners of the, the new drug to be developed. And these companies are known in the clin clinical trial context as sponsors, so because they are sponsoring the studies. And then you have the patients, also known as subjects or participants that volunteer to take either the drug or a placebo uh, to contribute to the studies. Uh, you also have sites. Sites are usually hospitals or clinicals, in other words, uh, or clinics. These are places that people actually go. And, and these are usually organizations that help to manage the patient side of things. Uh, in certain cases, the, uh, the patient population is too big and too dispersed. Um, and the sponsor may actually hire a third party just to help them manage this process on behalf of the sponsors. The third party is known as the CROs or contract research organizations, which are specialized in conducting clinical trials, collecting data and managing the logistics. Finally, there is also a very, very important type of player in this process, which is the regulators. Uh, in the United States, for example, this would be the FDA or Food and Drug Administration. In Canada, that would be Health Canada. And in other jurisdictions like the European Union, Japan, China, there are their own counterparts to the FDA or Health Canada as well. The role of the regulator uh, in this case also includes giving guidance on a whole lot of aspects as related to the drug or the potential drug to be developed, such as the production process, the labeling, and the necessary disclosure uh, of side effects, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, there are the sponsors, they do the studies on subjects or patients with the help of sites and CROs sometimes, and also uh, under the guidance of the regulators. That helps to paint, I hope that helps to paint a picture of who's who in this process. This also concludes my speech today. Thank you very much.